Hello, literature students, and welcome to this analysis of Porphyria's Lover, which is one of a number of poems written by Robert Browning that fall into the category of dramatic monologue, which basically means that through the lines of the poem, we hear a single voice, mono, and that voice is one that Browning is creating, like a piece of drama. This is a psychologically complex dramatic monologue, and it's therefore possible that you're studying this as part of a GCSE collection or part of a crime literature unit at A-level. Now, it's worth stating from the beginning that it seems pretty clear to me, at least, that the speaker in this poem is mad, and just by word of praise, right at the beginning, he strangles Porphyria with her own hair as a way of preserving what he perceives at least to be a perfect moment with her before toying with her body claiming that it's just what she wanted him to do anyway, and then bragging about his escape from God's justice. The poem begins in fairly ominous tone, with the weather being described as bleak and miserable. The rain set early in tonight, the sullen wind was soon awake. It tore the elm tops down for spite and did its worst to vex the lake. It seems, from the description, that this rural part of the world is not unused to poor weather, but on this particular evening, the rain and wind set in earlier than usual. This is a device called pathetic fallacy, which is where the natural world is used to reflect the emotions of the characters or the mood of the text. The wind is personified as being sullen, which creates a sad or depressed tone. And this mirrors the feelings of the male character, who is the speaker in this poem. And there's a sort of intent about the violence of the weather, which might mirror the violence of the speaker in the second half of the poem. The wind is so fierce, in fact, that it tears down the tops of the trees. And it does this out of spite, which suggests the desire to hurt or harm some other thing. In line five, we have the first use of the personal pronoun I, which confirms the first person perspective of this poem and also confirms that the speaker is in a sullen and depressed mood. He says he listened to the storm outside with heart fit to break. And the question here is, why? Is it because he misses Porphyria, his lover, or because his loneliness and the conditions outside have started to trigger some deeper and darker feelings within him? This is the first time that a full stop is used in the poem, which sounds like a really trivial point to make, but actually punctuation in poetry can be very significant. And here, the full stop separates the description of the setting from the entrance of Porphyria herself. And look at the verb here that's used to describe her entrance. In stark contrast to the conditions outside, she glides in almost ethereally like a creature from another world. This phrase is actually separated from the other lines by two bits of punctuation. The full stop at the end of the previous line and the semicolon that I've identified here. Now, if you've seen any of my other previous videos, you'll know that when we have a piece of punctuation within a line of poetry, it's called a caesura. And the fact that this line is emphasised by its separation from the surrounding lines shows just how significant this moment is. The word immediately after the sejura and which ends this line is the adverb straight, which in this context means immediately. And this shows the immediacy, the suddenness of the impact she has on the cottage and, of course, its occupant. And there's an interesting structural device here called a polysyndeton, which is basically where a number of conjunctions are used in close succession. And here, which I've indicated in green, we see a number of ands being used over a 10-line sentence, which describe 12 of the things that she does once entering the cottage. The first thing that she does is described as The first thing that she is described as doing is shutting out the cold and the storm, which, as I've just said, is the environmental backdrop to the poem. The fireplace is personified as cheerless, suggesting that just like the outside, the cottage and indeed its silent, inert occupant, it gives out no warmth or comfort. 
And the next action described is how she made the great blaze up, suggesting the power of her actions. And this creates an obvious opposition in the poem between her power and his passivity. She is active and, so far at least, he is inactive. And only when this is done does she remove her cloak, shawl and gloves, which of course are dripping wet. In a way, this prioritising of tasks conveys something quite interesting about their relationship, because on the one hand, you could argue that her love for him means that she values his comfort over her own, while on the other, it's worth pointing out that the last thing she does is sit down beside and call to him. Now, I'm just going to pause here for a nerdy moment on line structure. And I know that in previous videos, I've told you about iambic pentameter. And to be fair, your teachers have probably covered that a whole load of times as well. But this poem is written in something called an iambic tetrameter. And tetra comes from a Greek word meaning four. So the iambic rhythm is the same, which means it's every other syllable which is emphasised. But with a tetrameter, there are eight syllables per line and four beats. And I'm going to illustrate this with the line I was just referring to. And last, she sat down by my side. So a simple counting activity. First of all, you can see that this line has eight syllables. And then if you follow the rhythm of the line, you can find the four beats. Last, sat, by and side. And you can see how this structure emphasises the word last. Double emphasises it, in fact, because of the use of commas which separate the word from the rest of the line. Up until this point, neither have acknowledged the other, but on line 15, she called me. But even at this point, no voice replied. Now, we might conclude that this is because she's paid no attention to him until the atmosphere in the cottage is just as she wants it. Or perhaps it just confirms the dull mood that he is in with a heart fit to break, represented metaphorically by the storm outside. Notice another caesura in this line, which separates her effort to engage him with his refusal to do so. And this triggers a second polysyndetic sentence, which again emphasises her agency compared to his passivity. She puts my arm about her waist. And then, in an act of overt sexuality, which have, would have been especially scandalous for a prudish Victorian audience, she made her smooth white shoulder bare before letting her hair down and making his head rest upon her bare shoulder. Now, I've highlighted the word stooping here, and it's a really interesting verb to use in this context. And there are a couple of other texts I can think of where this verb appears with equal importance. In 1773, the play She Stooped, to Conquer by Oliver Goldsmith was first performed, while in another of Browning's poem, My Last Duchess, the murderous Duke of Ferreira states with cool matter-of-factness, I choose never to stoop. Now, the connection between all three of these texts with the use of this word is the inferred meaning of lowering or descending from a superior social position. And the fact that in this poem, the verb stooping is blocked off from the rest of the sentence by these commas here implies a degree of bitterness on the part of the speaker. He is aware of the class difference between them and perhaps feels that she is, I don't know, debasing herself in some way by behaving in the way that she is. And this sulking speaker, rather than feeling grateful, feels patronised by the condescension. Now, this may sound a bit unfair to Porphyria, who, let's face it, has come through a storm to see him, made the cottage a bit cheerier by lighting the fire, behaved in an affectionate way, and in the next line even murmurs how she loves him. 
But this is where we have to remember that the channel through which the poem is delivered to us is through the voice of a psychopath who, in a few lines' time, will murder Porphyria. It's only his thoughts and reflections that we are privy to, and that's one of the great things about the form of a dramatic monologue. It's only one version of events that we hear, and we have to decide to what degree we believe it. Now, the next part of the poem is probably the most challenging to unpick, but also the most important because it provides us with, in criminal terminology at least, the motive for the murder. He says that she is too weak for all her heart's endeavour to set its struggling passion free from pride and vainer ties dissever and give herself to me forever. Which, in plain English, means that the speaker believes Porphyria doesn't have the psychological strength or will to cut herself off from her upper-class ties, despite her heart's desire to do so. He knows that she will never give herself to him completely, coming from a lower class. And so, he knows the relationship is doomed. He continues by saying that passions sometimes would prevail. In other words, her love and desire for him would sometimes mean that she was prepared to leave her higher class social circle and continue the relationship with him. And the gay feast that she was at this evening was one of those occasions. So that evening, Porphyria had been at a party and had a sudden passionate thought of him in his cold, isolated cottage. And this is the reason, he says, that she came through the wind and rain to visit him. At this point, the speaker is brought more to life. He does something. He looks up at her eyes, which he then describes using the adjectives happy and proud. Now, this is the second time in the poem that Porphyria has been accused of pride. The first being, if you look back at line 24, and if you look up the meaning of this word, you'll find it connected to qualities such as being conceited, things like vanity and you know, being disdainful of others. Now, I must reiterate here that this is not necessarily an accurate portrait of Porphyria. Only the perspective of a deeply disturbed man seeking a motive for murder. Despite this, Porphyria's behaviour and murmurings of love had convinced him that Porphyria worshipped me. And he's both surprised and confused by this. His heart swells and he wonders what to do with this sudden realisation. Here, on line 36, he recognises the significance of what he perceives to be this moment of unspoilt perfection. The repetition of the word mine here suggests that for the first time he feels a degree of power or ownership over his lover. And it is this which he wants to preserve. And so at this point in the poem, we see a dramatic role reversal. In the eyes of the speaker, Porphyria has moved from an active agent, proud and powerful, to a worshipper. And he has shifted in his own perception from a passive, sulking commoner to a god. And so, with the logic of a psychopath, he preserves this moment by taking her hair, wrapping it, like in some perverse ritual, three times around her throat, and strangling her. And he continues this godlike presentation of himself by arguing that she felt no pain, as if she gave herself willingly, passively, sacrificially even. The conclusion of this poem contains a number of images of perceived life within the corpse of Porphyria. He animates her like a god bringing life to the dead. And this begins with the simile in line 43 as a shut bud that holds a bee, where the shut bud is the closed flower of a plant compared to the closed dead eyes of his lover. But when he carefully, warily, lifts them open, he sees the captured bee within the life that in reality he has snuffed out. He sees no corruption 
or stain or sign of death in her eyes. And this should remind us of lines 31 to 32, where he looks into her eyes and sees pride. Now, through her murder, the speaker feels that he has purified her of this sin, this stain. After untying the hair from around her throat, the speaker kisses her passionately and sees her cheeks blush bright, which of course he interprets as a physiological response to his affection, whereas in fact it's nothing more than the previously restricted blood rushing back into her head. He then plays with the corpse like a puppet master, moving it into a pose where he is the one exuding power and control. He mirrors her actions when she first entered the cottage, only this time the roles are reversed and it is his shoulder that bears the weight of her head. Browning brings us disturbingly into the present in the next line when he writes that her head droops upon his shoulder still. As in, they're still in this position now, just as he fantasised earlier in the poem, preserved forever. Now, as with a lot of poetry, the most significant details or subtleties of meaning are given towards the end, and this poem is no exception. The speaker describes the corpse as smiling, as if Porphyria is happy at what has become of her. Because this is what, according to the speaker, she wanted all along. She wanted this to happen. That she's been taken away from the upper class life full of pride and vanity. And he further transposes emotion onto his lifeless victim by suggesting that she never liked the life that she had in the first place. This upper class existence. She scorned it in fact, and is happy about the fact that this lifestyle has been replaced by death in the permanent presence of her lover. The speaker reinforces the point that he only killed her because this is what she wanted him to do in the final five lines by suggesting that it was the one thing that she'd been wishing, longing for, and that she had no idea how the speaker had tapped into and recognised this desire of hers before acting upon it. And that is the reason the speaker says that they sit in this same position together now. In fact, they stayed like that, unmoving all night long, realising the vision of frozen perfection he had earlier in the poem. The final line of the poem is really interesting because it throws a whole different angle on the mor morality of the speaker. He commits this murder, plays with the body, and yet God has not said a word. Now, Victorian society was a pious, God-fearing society, which at least outwardly extolled the virtues of reservation, reservation, restraint, and most of all, religion. And here, we have a challenge to that order of thinking. An impulsive, indulgent psychopath who murders an innocent, ostensibly loving victim, and yet the ultimate moral authority, the supreme judge over what is right and what is wrong, has not moved to strike him down in any form of punishment. And the speaker continues his delusion of grandeur by claiming that he has cheated justice and is mocking God. Or perhaps he's suggesting that there is no God at all. <laughs>